Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to In Deep Geek. Today is the next in an occasional series I've started called My Favourite Theory, in which I get on some of my favourite creators and they share a theory that they've come up with or that they've seen from elsewhere and explain it and then we discuss it and we try and get inside it and try and uh, break it down a little bit and hopefully come to some sort of shared agreement on the theory itself. And today I've got one of my favourite creators in the community. I'm sure you all know who he is already. Guys, could you please welcome Smoke Screen? Uh, Chris, do you want to say hi? Uh, yes, hello, everybody. Thank you, Robert, for finally having me on. We've been talking for, for a few months now about getting together, so I really appreciate it, man. I enjoy your stuff as well, and um, I'm glad, glad to be here. Okay, so uh, as you've probably seen from the title of this, this is a theory about what the White Walkers want and what their end game is. But I will let Chris himself explain what the theory is, and then we'll try and get into it in a little bit more detail. So go ahead. What is the theory? Well, basically, this started for me uh, well over two years ago on the channel. I was coming into it like we were talking before, and um, I was trying to figure out the end game, you know, before the last two books are published and before season eight of, of the show. And um, it's more about what's going to happen um, as far as the end game in, in the sense of not necessarily, well, I guess what the White Walkers want could be tied into it for sure. But it's more about um, what location and what's actually going to happen at that location. In other words, how can you kill the Night King? How does he is he destroyed? Is it uh, a one on one combat thing with John? You know, um, but I, I, I go beyond that because I believe that with John being the Song of Ice and Fire in the sense of uh, Rhaegar and Lyanna or plus Illicus J, that's been confirmed. It has to be something magical with his blood. Otherwise, there's really no point in that at all. You know, he could have been just a bastard from Winterfell that rose to power um, through the Night's Watch and then didn't really want all this stuff, but took it and became a leader, et cetera, et cetera. So I just started diving into, uh, you know, why him and what's going to happen in the end game and, and how to kill the Night King type of thing. So we called it a dragon raised by wolves that kind of centered around John, but you know, it's, it's about uh, all the main cast, or I, I guess uh, the main characters, but um, it, and it started to focus on the God's eyes started to stand out to me. So um, basically, I started looking into some ideas about um, why this place may be important in the show uh, and the, or I'm sorry, in the books and possibly the show. If they do some kind of, you know, intro for the God's Hour Isle of Faces specifically, it was only mentioned, I believe, in season two by Tywin uh, really quickly in yeah. reference to the mountain burning the Riverland. So uh, that's how I got started. And it. it's been, uh, again, two and a half years. I have a whole series on my channel about a dragon raised by wolves. Um, five different parts about it. We kind of started diving in and getting deeper and deeper until finally we, we uh, reveal in part five the details of what we think is going to happen. Fantastic. And I should say that the, the links to all of the videos you're talking about, I'll put them down in the description. Okay, so so the theory is that this is going to be about the Isle of Faces. Let's Let's try and unpick that first. So what do you think the Isle of Faces is first? Well, uh, I came to the conclusion after kind of diving into this that the, you know, it started with the actual idea started with the video I did about gods in Westeros. Um, you have the, uh, this idea of being, uh, the, you know, this red god, R'hllor, the you know, this great other, um, the great stallion, you know, the drowned god, the the storm god, all these, all these things. And based off how George R. R. Martin writes and, um, I would imagine his feelings in real life probably permeates his his um, manuscripts. I, I didn't believe there are gods in Westeros. So that's what kind of started it was when Melisandre sees Bran and Bloodraven in A Dance with Dragons. You know, he's he see, she sees um, uh, basically those two and uh, identifies and basically assigns them to agents of the of the great other um, whose name cannot be spoken, you know. And of course, we know Melisandre as a as a fire worshiper, a fire priestess of of Lore, the Red God. And when you take that into account and say, well, she thinks that Bran and Bloodraven, through her visions in the flames, are you know servants or champions of the Great Other, and we know that Bran and Bloodraven are simply green seers, um, you know, tied to weirwood trees or whatnot, then you kind of can assume that there is no old God in the sense of actual gods. And therefore you can kind of, uh, kind of parallel that with her own religion and say, there is no red God. So that's how it started. Um, and then I started looking into 
it is start the, the the order of the green men stood out to me in the first couple of chapters of a game of thrones and of course that was um bran and catlin both mentioned that in the very first chapters of the book and i looked into thinking what are the order of the green men guarding where are they signed this pact what are they guarding you know what's there um and it kind of occurred to me, maybe this is the kind of, uh, as I called it in the, in the video, um, the, the CPU or central nervous system of what we call werewood.net. Yeah. So uh, it kind of it kind of grew from there. And I just kept kind of researching and, and digging into um, things based off of that. So it started with another completely different idea and ended up, uh, ended up here at the Isle of Faces. Excellent. I mean, I think we spoke briefly before we went on air, and I think that what we'll probably find is that I agree with quite a lot of this thinking, because it's the kind of thing that I've been working my way towards myself over, over a number of videos. Now, just just to unpick the bit about the gods before we get on to the god's eye and sure. the weirwood net, my general view on this, I think I would agree that George R. R. Martin isn't going to show us the gods. I think that his literary perspective is that actually what matters about the gods is not whether they exist so much as whether people believe in them and that's the same for prophecies and all kinds of other things like that so what matters the example i often use is with with melisandre it actually matters a lot less whether the lord of light exists a lot less than the fact that melisandre believes it completely and it is her belief that drives her and drives everything that happens as a result of her uh, her faith so I think that what we're seeing here is George R. R. Martin actually showing us a very grounded, very low fantasy uh, in terms of the religion kind of uh, epic where it's the actions of people that matter, not the actions of gods. Does that kind of chime in with, with where you were thinking? No, absolutely. I agree 100%. I think that's the important part. I think that you, you know, in the case of Melisandre, you know, from her perspective, she's doing great things for the world. And it's through this lens of her religion. You know, she's obviously been trained in some kind of magic. Uh, we know magic is a real thing. And she sees it through the prism of her own religion. She she, she believes that the source of that magic um, is her God. So I completely agree. That's exactly what, exactly what I'm thinking. Excellent. And just taking then, we've got, if we're talking about the gods, we've then got the God's Eye Lake. And I love this idea of this being the hub. Uh, again, it's something I've mentioned a few times is that uh, the Weirwood Network appears to be connected underground. They appear to be, uh, you don't just have individual Weirwood trees. Where the trees don't grow seems to be where they cannot connect up with the, the rest of the network. And it makes sense that there is some kind of center to this. Now, uh, one thing which I, I think I would love to hear you speak a little bit more about is something I've heard you say before about this idea of the heart tree, uh, which we often hear about, you know, in the, in the center of a godswood, we have the weirwood being the heart tree and the idea that the network itself has got a heart and that heart being at the God's eye. Could you just like talk us through that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. And really quickly too, to, to back up your idea about the, um, the werewoods, I completely agree. And especially in the books, you have a lot of underground caverns, but um, you know, I think the, the, um, the eerie idea was what kind of clued me in on that was they tried to plant a werewood in the eerie and their God's wood, so to speak, and it wouldn't take root. Um, it's so far up in the mountains, it could not attach itself to the hive mind, so to speak. So I think that kind of supports that idea as well. Yeah, um, as far I, as the, and, and it's not just there, it's also on the iron islands and then across into dawn uh, and things like that. It's, it's, it's very clear that if there's a barrier in some way, lots of stone or something like that. Then absolutely. That, absolutely. That the roots cannot reach. So therefore, yeah, it can't become part of it and can't live. So I believe that is, I believe that supports that. And, and I agree with that hundred percent. Um, as far as the heart tree, you know, when I was digging into this theory and, and, and trying to kind of find stuff to support it or, you know, shoot it down for that matter. Um, the idea of the, what, what Catelyn called the heart tree in Winterfell just kind of, uh, you know, after, and this is probably the fifth or sixth time I've read this, you know, stuff, um, or, or more for, for that matter. But it started when I, when I started thinking about through the prism of this idea of the Isle of Faces and the end game that took a different meaning to me when you first read you know you know it's the heart tree of winterfell you take it as it's the 
this central location, right, of any God's wood is the heart tree. And of course, like in King's Lang, that's an oak tree. It's not even a weirwood. So you take it as the center, which it probably means that to those people in that context. But when you start thinking about through the prism of this theory about the Isle of Faces and the other, the other clues that come up, um, it's almost like George is literally telling you that this is the heart of weirwood.net in the sense of it's the it's the organ or CPU or brain or whatever you want to call it, whatever um, uh, illusion you want to pick of how this thing works and operates. So I think um, in regards to that, that once you start thinking through that lens or, or I'm sorry, watch once you start looking through things through that lens of uh, trying to, you know, put together or dismantle a theory, then the word heart tree takes on a whole new meaning. It's almost a literal thing. And uh, so that's what started making me kind of clue in on the, the idea of the Isle of Faces being this heart of the entire Weirwood network. And that kind of makes sense as well, I think, in terms of not just geographically, because it's sort of in the center, really, but also the, the Weirwood network is not just a sort of like a, a hive mind that there is some sort of a home base. And it's clearly a place of great magical power. It's uh, if you go all the way through history, it's, it's noticeable that people do not go there. But it's we, we only know of really two people who've been there. There was Howland Reed and there was Adam Velaryon. Um, exactly. Uh, very noticeable. Uh, spoiler alert, guys. I don't know whether spoiler alert counts for things that weren't in a book, but there was <laughs> not any additional information in Fire and Blood about Adam Velaryon's visits to the Isle of Faces, which was one of the the big things that I was looking for, for a potential clue about what was going on. But I think that just adds to this idea that this is something which is important that George R. R. Martin is holding back because we're not yet allowed to see it. And he built it up quite early on, this idea of the Isle of Faces. It's mentioned a lot in book one, then just like a couple of times in the other books. And this is coming from the starting point where he originally was planning to write a trilogy. So he was trying to set the seeds for things in part one that he would pay off then at the end. So we should be looking to the beginning of the story for a lot of the threads that are going to be picked up right at the end of the story. So I think I would agree with you that the Isle of Faces is clearly the centre of the Weirwood network, obviously connected in then with the children of the forest and the old magic and the old gods and all the rest of it, and that this is also central to the end of the story. Now, how do you therefore link this across to the, the White Walkers, the what do you think then is the link between those two things? Yeah. So, uh, and, and I agree exactly hundred percent with what you just said, you know, and it ties back to, you know, if that is in, in fact, the kind of the central nervous system, the heart, so to speak, you know, that ties in and fits with why the order of the green men are there. And as you mentioned, it's mentioned so early in, in, in game of Thrones and Catelyn brand, all that stuff, the Isle of faces is mentioned, it's mentioned in John's first chapter, He's thinking about, you know, what he's not going to be able to see going to the Night's Watch. And he mentions the Isle of Faces, among other things. Uh, Danny's first chapter, you know, she has never seen these places in Westeros and she includes the Isle of Faces. So it's obviously clearly important. It's not just world building at that point. Um, but what got me going is, is, like you said, to find the end, you need to go to the beginning. I agree with that 100 percent. So I started looking um, back at the prologue, actually, to get kind of going when I started looking into this and it was based off the one descriptor we had of the order of the green men. And that was the word silent. So I thought, I thought, okay, well let's go back to the prologue again and see if we can make some kind of connection to the white walkers and the Isle of faces as in that's where they may be headed, or at least that's where they may have to go or somebody has to go to do something to perhaps uh, stop the night King and the white walkers, the others, so you had this one word, uh, the green men and their silent watch, you know, in the uh, very early on in Game of Thrones. So when you go back to the prologue, you start to see that they are described as silent and they move on silent feet. Um, there's a few uh, uh, men mentions of the word silent before that, you know, Will and Garrod. Um, he could have picked different descriptors, but that was the only one you can take from the first descriptor of the order of the green men at the Isle of Faces. And then you go back to the prologue and you start to see this connection with how they move silently. They move on silent feet, et cetera. 
So that was the first little connection there with the actual White Walkers, which now, of course, we know were created by the children and actually the Isle of Faces and this order of the green men that only two people have ever visited in the entire story. Yeah, and I think that for me, there are also other kind of links across. So I don't subscribe to the idea that everything that happens on the show will happen in the books. But I think that the creation of the White Walkers, the others, is going to be very similar in the books. So in other words, the others were created by the children as a weapon against humanity. And I think for me, the biggest evidence of that is actually what they are like. They are these creatures who are apparently immune to human weapons, the weapons that humans usually used. They can use the humans' numbers against them. Whenever a human dies, they can raise it to life to have them on their side. And they are stronger than humans. They are all the things that the children were not added to which they are vulnerable to the things that the children would be using. So they are vulnerable to dragon glass, which is what the children of the forest would be using. And they appear to have issues with crossing water. And the children of the forest seem to have their most important or holiest places, including the Isle of Faces, in the middle of water. So clearly, if you were to design a monster, a super weapon to be destroying humans, this is what you would create. So I agree. I think we're on the same page here. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And I, this is going to be a theme, I suspect, running all the way through it. And there's also, and guys, you know, I like to sort of throw out to other creators who've come up with really uh, interesting thoughts. Joe Magician, who I had on my live stream a few weeks ago, he's done a great video quite recently about the prologue and just drawing out all of the linguistic uh, links between the others and the forest and we tend to think of the forest as being about the children of the forest and the others as being all just about ice but actually the, the language use in the prologue is very clear that the the wood is connected to the others so from the very beginning we have this very clear idea that there is a connection there between the others and the children of the forest and that obviously then means that this is starting to feed into our understanding of what on earth they might be wanting because this is for me the big unanswered question in the, the books and the show is what on earth do the White Walkers want? We know George R. R. Martin is always saying everyone's a hero in their own story. This means that they have got a reason for doing what they're doing. And it's not just that they woke up one morning and decided to kill some humans. That's not what they're about. They've got a goal in mind. So this theory that we're talking through right now suggests that their goal is the Isle of Faces. So do you want to talk us through that little link now as to why on earth they might be wanting to get to the Isle, to the Isle of Faces? Yeah, I mean, this is what kind of drove me as well, is this has got to be, for me at least, this big third twist, right? I mean, you, you had the Hodor moment uh, for the show. Um, you had, obviously, Shireen. Um, I didn't quite buy Shireen as the big second twist. I thought a lot of us saw that coming. Um, but we'll see. I'm, I'm sure this goes down in the books. I do agree 100% that um, it is the same in the books as far as the children. I mean, I think the connections are there, as you mentioned. Um, but I, I started thinking, OK, so what would be a reason to go? I mean, this is a place that's been protected by, you know, this order of the green men. Um, a few people have been there in return. But other than that, you don't hear about it. It's kind of put out there almost like the prologue itself. And then occasionally you're reminded of this mysterious place. So the idea came to me that maybe um, with uh, at least the show started kind of giving me ideas when we started, because obviously we're, we're so far past the books in the show, is that the Night King didn't seem too afraid of Valyrian steel, uh, dragon glass. Obviously, we saw White Walkers die of Valyrian steel, but that doesn't necessarily mean the Night King can. Um, so I was thinking, you know, He's got to have his own perspective, as you mentioned. You know, uh, the the villain is the hero of the other side. What if he wants something that's not? Uh, he's doing a lot of bad, horrible things to to accomplish it. Obviously, so we you obviously can't ignore that. But what does he actually want? And for me, it started. To, to, I started to think about what if you know what what thing could he actually want? Uh, first of all, he has to be reacting to something fairly recently. Um, he just didn't decide to come back at some random time, uh, let's say to, to catch a, a couple dragons because there's been dragon riders up until 150 years ago. 
So you have to come up a little more recent, and I think for something he's reacting to. And it seems to me it's like a an opportunity. I know a lot of people think he's reacting to uh, Jon Snow. Um, he goes after Waymar Royce, who's described to look a lot like Jon Snow. So that would suggest he knows prophecy or knows, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and then it occurred to me that maybe he simply wants to remove this curse. Because uh, essentially, this is what this is. I mean, this is the first man. I call him a proto Stark, of course, on my channel. And uh, I think he's uh, that's probably part of the, the the secret of the Starks that they may or may not know. They may have been covered up. But let's say he he actually just wants to finally rest because he's been he was captured against his will, dragon glass shoved in his chest that possibly gave him his weakness as well, like you mentioned before, especially with the other White Walkers. We we obviously know that. But I'm thinking, okay, if their magic created him and uh, let's say Valyrian steel or dragon glass does not hurt the Night King, which will be a, a big a big moment if that happens in the show, especially in season eight, we'll see. Then what do you do to stop him or what does he do? Uh, maybe you, you, if it was put in with magic and we don't know what kind of enchantment was involved or, you know, whatever as far. We just know the dragon glass was shoved in his chest. And I'm assuming that'll follow pretty close in the books. What if it takes magic or let's say the destruction of magic to end that curse? So what if his goal was not to just kill everybody, but not... He wants to meet his makers, obviously, and destroy people. And that was their original intent was to turn men's numbers against them. But what if he simply wants that thing to be removed in some way and it can't without the magical aspect being destroyed that created him in the first place? Yeah, I think this makes a huge amount of sense to me. Just to pick up on the third twist, for those who aren't aware, uh, the, the showrunners said that when they were told, when George R. R. Martin told them what was going to happen for the the rest of the story a long time ago then there were three twists three wtf moments for them the first was hodor the second shireen and the third hasn't happened so will happen next season personally i think that's going to be something that will happen with john and danny rather than what's going to happen with the white walkers i think that they were talking about moments that would affect characters that we would care about rather than plot twists explaining why things were happening but that's a slight digression away from uh, what we're talking about right now so in terms of what they want and i think this is a fascinating subject because there are lots of different theories about this but is there this kind of night king knight queen issue are they are they looking for a mate um are they just wanting to meet their creators i think the most likely reason for them to be going south is exactly what you say it's the this idea that they have got some curse on them and they want to break it in some way they want to confront the the, the people who made them and that is shown on the show by the kind of the swirly symbol as much as anything else this is them showing they're sending out a message to people that they remember the moment of their creation or the night king remembers the moment of his creation and that right the north remembers <laughs> exactly <laughs> and and this is it, it's sort of dropped in with the in the books as well that they leave art behind is the way that uh mance raider talks about it that would leaving the dead bodies in patterns and i think that this is they are trying to tell people they can't talk the same language as humans but they're trying to explain what it is that they're wanting and why they're going there so just to pick up on what next then they're heading south they're wanting to get to the isle of faces which is presumably where this magic took place or where they think that the magic can take place to end all of this what's the what's the plan then are they just going to go straight there and and then what um i think that it's it's kind of a combo like i mentioned a minute ago i think you know obviously they're they're killing a lot of people building their army i think at the same time it's it's a revenge i, I think you, you you can't ignore that it is type a revenge type thing they they they're killing mass loads of people including the children themselves obviously in the show um i believe there are children left at the island probably other places at least in the books um for sure but the idea is as i started to think about um kind of going back to melisandre is like okay so they go there that makes sense but what are they going to do i started looking into melisandre again because she had 
people burning weirwood branches. And in fact, uh, at Storm's End in the God's Wood, they burned the weirwood tree there. And of course, that was the big reason that the children created the White Walkers in the first place, right? Is men came over the first men and then the Andals. And they both had the issues with them burning down and cutting down weirwood trees, which was, you know, to them, their gods, their magic, whatever. So it would be um, kind of poetic in the sense of um, the reason they created them in the first place. And then, of course, it's kind of the nuclear option. It was a horrible thing. It threw the season out, seasons out of balance, that type of thing. Wouldn't it be poetic if in order to stop this, this um, unholy creation, so to speak, that you have to destroy the heart of your own gods in the first uh, that, that created the Night King in the first place, the magic so my idea was once I started looking back at burning werewoods and things like that and, and the reasons that the children created them in the first place, it got me to Melisandre, who has people wilding, specifically burning werewood branches. He, she tells John directly, you know, um, burn this tree and take Winterfell as a gift from the Lord of Light. Um, you know, swearing a vow to a tree is no more powerful than swearing a vow to your shoes, you know, all this type of stuff. But she's indirectly right in that way if this is the case. She's telling John essentially, you need to burn werewoods. Um, and, you know, in her context, it's just to ignore the old gods. They're not real, whatever. But I think she's indirectly telling us that that's what needs to happen. So I think I think the Owl of Faces has to burn. I think he's going there to burn the, the werewoods, destroy them like the first men did, that he was created to stop them for in the first place. And that would essentially get rid of the magic, bittersweet, right? All magic dies, because I believe that's the source of all magic. And that would uh, essentially end that, and then that would undo his so-called curse. Right, so what we've got here is this bizarre situation then, where we get the White Walkers who want to destroy the Weirwood Trees. We get Melisandre and the army of fire of whatever that's going to be wanting to destroy the weirwood trees and then you get whatever army that john will end up leading also wanting to destroy the weirwood trees so we're actually on this logic going to end up with a situation where everybody's trying to destroy the weirwood trees except for people like blood raven and bran is that how you see it panning out uh, something like that, because we mentioned that in, in that video series, I believe was, uh, is the idea is that they almost will have the same goal. So let's say John figures out what's has, if he's the, you know, John and Danny, the prince or princess that was promised, if you buy into prophecy and, you know, I believe it fits everybody, but, uh, either way, he's obviously the central focus of this story. And, uh, it is about his, uh, magical mixture of Targaryen, uh, first men and Valyrian blood. So it's almost like they have the same goal. They just don't know it yet. And that's really ironic. You know, they, he may, let's say he finds out from Bran, you know, Bran goes into the past and realizes, you know, you have to, you have to do this in order to stop him. Valyrian still won't work. Um, dragon glass won't work. He's already got it in his chest. Literally, it's literally there. So why would a, a dragon glass arrow affect him? I mean, can you cut him in the first place? You know, that type of stuff comes into question. So if you buy into the idea that he has to burn the Isle of Faces, um, he wants to do it already, but of course, John and the whole, uh, what we call the heroes of the story, since the, the quote unquote good guys, um, they need to do the same thing. So it's almost the same goal. And, uh, that's, uh, really interesting to me how that would pan out. Yeah. And there are the other things I'd want to say about this because it's just, it sends my mind sort of whirring off in lots of different directions. One of the things that I really like is the fact that George R. R. Martin, as we all know, he's he's a pacifist. He he is not, in my mind, going to write a story where the answer to all of the problems that we've got is a big battle where lots of people kill each other. Exactly. I honestly can't exactly. see that that is going to be the, the, the end game. It might be, and this is my big fear for the show, it might be where the show ends up going, but in the books, I honestly cannot see the solution to all of these problems being there being a big battle and somebody kills somebody else. So that has to kind of have some other closer to a negotiated settlement or an agreement that actually ends all of this 
fighting. And I think we, we will see an end to the fighting. But I just want to tease out uh, one aspect of this before getting on to what I think is the sort of the twist on this. So Bran. Bran is going to be completely opposed to this. If we've got this idea that we're building up, that the White Walkers are heading down to try and destroy the Weirwood Network, that John might suddenly think, oh, actually, this is the way to do it. Melisandre will be very happy to do it. Bran is suddenly going to find himself in opposition to all of those people. Do you think that this is how Bran dies? Actually, uh, I, I kind of do. I, I just have this feeling we have to lose one more Stark at least. Um, you know, uh, so I've, I've questioned this as well. I'm not sure that Bran, once he realizes what it means, that he would necessarily be opposed to it. I've actually went as far as saying, just as, as a wild guess, not really anything to back it up, but I thought, because a lot of people ask, well, if they have to destroy the werewolf trees in several live streams and things like that, and Q&As after the theory came out, you know, what, what happens to Bran? Um, well, magic doesn't sustain him necessarily, um, but it does. He is in this place where he's got all this going through his head. And it made me think, um, what if, you know, this happens and does it kill him? Uh, does he have uh, what I call a Hodor moment? You know, it's almost uh, a little payback, even though it wasn't really his fault in the sense of, I mean, he was trying to save the world. Everybody's done horrible things to save the world, including Melisandre, by the way. She thinks she's trying to save the world. She's trying. So I do think she actually believes that. And I think Bran as well. But I don't know. Would he be opposed to burning down the last of the 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 the, the magic, so to speak, or the weirwood trees? Um, or would he be for it because he knows it saves the world? I, I don't know. That's a great well, question. Well, my general take on this is that I think we see Bloodraven as a sort of foreshadowing of Bran. And so we would, I personally expect that we will see Bran increasingly get sort of sucked up within the Weirwood net and becoming a part of it. And we saw that with Bloodraven was that he was there, but then also a lot of his old personality been sort of sucked up. And, and on the show, it's very clear that Bran himself has almost gone. He is now being the Three-Eyed Raven. That is the role that he inhabits. And so I think that actually, regardless of whether the Weirwood Network gets destroyed, I think that his end game is being sucked up within the Weirwood Network. And it would perhaps add some kind of extra tragedy to this if, as a way of destroying the White Walkers, the others, uh, it, John, if it is indeed him who does something like this, has to also kill Bran. I think that would be a, an, an extra layer of tragedy on here. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, he's definitely part of this. And again, it was just the question of what would what would actually happen to him physically. But no, I, I agree. I think that would make complete sense as far as, you know, you know, John, you got to destroy the world uh, or to save the world. I'm sorry. But in order to do so, you, you have to kill your little, you know, brother um that well you that grew up as a brother <laughs> so um, I, I think it makes sense uh you know regardless of how whether he has to kill him you know um physically uh, or or actually the burning of the werewood.net you know isle of faces uh brain so to speak actually kills him in the process i don't know either way i, I agree that i think he probably goes out that way okay so i think we're in broad agreement here I, I think where I would want to just as a as a theory as a whole, I would want to try and balance this against my general take of where the end game has to go, at which is that George R. R. Martin often talks about fire and ice as both being this is the Robert Frost poem, of course, uh, both being these forces that could destroy the planet. And so we shouldn't see this as a battle of good fire against bad ice. And so the end game is about fire destroying the ice. This is about restoring the balance in some way. So we have to emerge, personally, I believe, we have to emerge from this story with if the, the threat from the others has gone, the threat from fire 
also has gone. So how do you, if you agree with that, I don't know whether you do, but how would you marry those two things? Because the theory that you've set out has been very much along the lines of this is how ice, the others, is going to be ended, and it's going to be ended by fire. And that leaves fire very much in charge and in control. Do you agree that we need this kind of balance? And if so, how do you think that's going to come about? Yeah, absolutely. I do. Uh, we set out this um, this first episode two and a half years ago or whatever of Dragon Raised by Wolves with the idea of symmetry and balance. And that's exactly what we were saying. So, yeah, I mean, I believe um, in, in the sense of what people can expect to see on the show or reading the books. I definitely think that um, taking that into account that you can't have the end of this thing where, um, you know, like you said, fire destroys ice in that sense or whatever. Um, there is no good ice or bad fire, you know, that type of thing. It's, 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 they're both good and bad and, and, and gray, so to speak, uh, just like his characters. So I think that's a, a running theme throughout. So I think it goes into the idea that, you know, you, you may have to lose the dragons forever. Um, maybe even the bloodlines forever, Targaryen and Stark, or perhaps maybe there's just one combined, um, you know, maybe the offspring of John and Danny. Um, is fire and ice, you know, forever as opposed to these opposing forces, uh, which has been presented to us in the books and show. So I definitely think that comes into it as a thing to expect, you know, if magic is gone and magic and dragons, for example, are magical creatures. Now, again, we don't really know the what that means in the sense of, I mean, they go out and eat like everything else. If magic is destroyed, they just drop dead because they're, they're supposedly magical. I don't know, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel right to me if you destroy one side of that and then you still have dragons or one dragon left or whatever, you know, uh, running around. Uh, so I agree that in that bittersweet aspect of it, um, it's all got to go in some way. Uh, I also would like to point out that I think this goes into not just the physical ideas of dragons versus like white walkers, but in this whole theme of change and throughout these books and show, it's also about the powers that be in Westeros, right? You have these, you know, lords and big houses who, um, and then the small folk. It comes down to it shouldn't matter what your last name is. It shouldn't matter if you're a bastard of Winterfell or a bastard, period. Um, people are people and they all have good, bad. They all do great things and horrible things. And that's his whole thing, right? Writing about the, the human heart in conflict with itself. So uh, to me, it makes sense for. In that aspect, um, the White Walkers are gone, but the dragons are also gone. But then you have to get into the idea of we have to break the wheel in the sense of not just the Night King never returning for another cycle of this whole thing, but break the wheel in the sense of, you know, feudalism itself. So I think you'll see some kind of epilogue where things start to change as far as how they govern the whole entire realm. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think one of the things that when I've been reading Fire and Blood, I've been reminded of is the Dance of the Dragons. And I think that this shows the way that the dragons and the Targaryens, they can destroy themselves. Absolutely. I think that what we're looking to see, well, what, what could possibly be killing these dragons? And it's been very clear to me reading Fire and Blood, there are lots of ways to kill dragons. That is actually not the issue here. And I think that the idea that the Night King gets a dragon, that one dragon can kill another dragon very easily. It's happened many times. Dragons can be killed by being shot by a scorpion arrow through or bolt through their eye. There's lots of different ways to kill a dragon. So I think, yes, what we're going to see is we're going to see the end of the others and i think that that is through the removal of the curse as you, as you say i think the most logical thing for that is for them to be trying to destroy the isle of faces and what's going on there and the for the balance to happen with the end of the dragons now i personally don't like the idea of there being john and danny having a child who's going to grow up to rule the world afterwards i don't personally like that i don't like it on a that just seems a little bit hackneyed kind of level but also on a kind of symbolic level i don't like it because that's john is the merging of ice and fire danny represents fire so the, the child of the two of them does not equal the balance as it were i uh, agree i agree I actually was going to say i said that in the in the very beginning of that series as well as a lot of people uh, at least in the show 
will label if you if you, you know throw these labels around just for the sake of discussion but they they label you know like melisandre herself she said in season seven i brought together ice and fire and i was like no no you didn't you brought together fire and fire <laughs> or fire and both um the night king is ice danny is absolutely fire and john is both so i agree i said that before in a live stream as a matter of fact is I don't, um, although that may happen in the sense of the show or something, if we get some type of epilogue scene, you know, that may be a year later or six years later or whatever it may be. Um, I don't like that idea either because it, then you're taken away from John being the first child of ice and fire from the, the old uh, pact of ice and fire that never happened back in the dance of the dragon days. So I agree completely that he is that embodiment. It's got to be about him and his blood right now, as opposed to his child, which would be just, you know, um, mostly a Targaryen. I agree. And what I think we're going to end up, and we think we've moved now slightly just beyond the theory, so perhaps we'll just sort of wrap it up with this. What I think we'll end up, as you say, is the what is left of humanity. We're going to have the cripples, bastards, and broken things who survive. It's not the, the people who were struggling for the Iron Throne. I personally don't think the Iron Throne itself will survive. I think that what we're going to have are the people who have been damaged, the people who have been the outcasts. These are the people who are going to be uh, left with building from the rubble of what happened before. I hope we don't get some kind of like Harry Potter 20 years later thing. I don't like that idea at all. I love the idea that we just get a few hints about what might happen and we know those characters who are left and we know that they would try and do the right thing because they are the people who we actually fundamentally respect because they value humanity. So I think I'm going to wrap that one up there. I think what we found going through that, probably quite apparent, was that we've got quite similar thinking on this, is that there's a the reason why the others are on the move is because they are looking for revenge, but also looking to end the curse in some way. The most logical way for them to do that is to head to the Isle of Faces. The most logical thing for them to do when they get there is to destroy it in some way. But then we obviously then need to get some kind of balance at the end to make sure that ice and fire are balanced going forward, perhaps with the threat of the others being gone and the threat of the dragons being gone. Is there anything else you'd want to sort of add on to that just as a sort of a, a post script on this theory uh no I, I think you i think you said it all i think we've said it all throughout this little uh, video here i mean i think we pretty much agree with every uh with um the idea that this whole thing has to you know the wheel has to be broken you know uh, you can't have a another pact you know with the night king going away again and then it happens again in another 300 years or whatever or eight thousand years for that matter so you have to break the wheel you have to destroy he has to be killed this time for for good and uh, I agree. You have to end with uh, with balance and, um, you know, uh, just at least. Uh, and I agree. I don't want to see a full fledged uh, 30 minutes of how things are 10 years later. I just wanted to see, you know, little hints of a dream of spring, so to speak, and how things are changing. And uh, you'll see, you know, you'll see some hints possibly of the, the feudalistic state going away, the monarchy. Uh, again, it won't be like some overnight democracy. Um, I agree also with what you said about the Iron Throne. I've been saying that for years that I think it will be melted down as the symbol of this feudalism in that sense. Um, so that would be uh, very cool to see that go away. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, that's the way it should end or, or needs to end. It's the most logical um, place this story is going for me as, as far as the themes of the story. So. Excellent. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Do you agree? Do you think that we missed something obvious? Just let me know down in the comments. I'd love to know what you think. But Chris, it's been fantastic having you on. For those who don't know, uh, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on YouTube. Uh, Smokescreen is the channel. So uh, just uh, if you type in Smokescreen Game of Thrones, you'll, you'll see all the stuff there. But uh, and of course, in any video description, all my social media and all that good stuff is there to, to follow me in all those places. But yeah, man, I really appreciate you having me on. I enjoyed it, and uh, I'm, I think we're on the same page. <laughs> I think we are too. Okay, guys, that's it for this time. I'll be back at some point soon with another of my favorite creators with another theory to be discussing. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you again soon.